Welcome to you all. And uh, uh, I'm very glad and happy that we have Martin Kren with us uh, tonight. Uh, before starting this talk uh, about uh, the work of Martin Kren in the exhibition, uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, Sophie Uitz and Tina Madel. Uh, we work all together to organize uh, uh, this talk that is actually a series of talks uh, regarding the show that is coming to its end. Uh, it will be in the beginning of April. Martin, hello. And uh, I would like actually to start uh, immediately in the work uh, in terms uh, to first present uh, Martin Kren, that is a very known artist uh, uh, with a really a big uh, history of works that are of our key interest. Uh, it's uh, works that are working with anti-Semitism, that are making a sharp critique, I will say, of the history of Austria, relations to what's going on today in the present. And uh, also his uh, researcher, curator, a teach, teacher at the, uh, muse the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. Uh, the work that uh, actually Martin will take us through uh, has a title, Austria is a Wonderful Country. And uh, that we can capture better and start our talk, I will uh, start also the share screening. So you see, uh, the work of uh, uh, Martin Kren that is in the exhibition space of the uh, Welt Museum uh, with this title that I just mentioned uh, with several elements. And the idea of this talk is that we really go deeply into this work. What is also important for us to know is that the work was done appositely for the exhibition. And the topic of the exhibition is actually uh, the research of antisemitism, colonialism, and turban nationalism. The work of Martin is directly tangentially connected with this research of antisemitism, is going deep in the history of Austria, but bring this history to the present of Austria and also with what we have today. And uh, uh, this research is uh, remarkable because uh, as you will see, this is also my deep uh, intimate opinion, exists a lot of historical material, but must be a will a knowledge, a concept, a political stance, I will say, to go into these questions and actually make them visible today because they are necessary to be made visible, but made visible in a very peculiar and very strategical artistic way. So, Martin, if we start from uh, the work, Austria is a wonderful country. Uh, can we and we see this uh, title also imprinted onto the floor and the whole arrangements with the historical photograph and then also with the video. Could you give us an idea why you decided for this title? Yes, uh, thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, for giving me uh, the opportunity to speak here about my work. And hello to everyone who joins us today. Um, yeah, to give an answer to your question, <clears throat> actually, uh, as maybe some of you know, uh, I did quite some, quite a lot of works uh, about history, history politics, remembrance, um, and uh, also uh, about uh, Austrian history of national socialism, how Austria dealt with its history. Uh, so there was for a long time this myth uh, of Austria being the first victim of Nazi Germany. So um, there was one thing that uh, I always, um, uh, it was one thing that I always wondered uh, and this is uh, the starting point when, when, uh, when the first, the first days 
uh, when Austria, um, when the Anschluss happened and uh, the Austrian people on the streets uh, forced uh, the Austrian Jewish people uh, to clean the streets. Um, and this uh, was, a, so, so to say, uh, under quotation mark, speciality uh, that happened uh, in Austria. Uh, These programs in this form didn't happen anywhere else. And it was also the beginning of uh, a, a brutal form of uh, anti-Semitic uh, programs. And I was always asking myself, how was it possible um, this moment um, when actually uh, there were passers-by and, uh, and standing there and cheering and laughing when others were forced um, to this, uh, to this uh, cruelties and why uh, and also on the photos you see that there are also uh, kids um, young adults and it's it's and older people women men so it seems it was there was not a one group that only did it so how could this happen and maybe a few weeks before they greeted uh, them on the street friendly, or maybe bought something in their shops or, or whatever. So this group dynamics, so to say, and at the same time, this anti-Semitism that must, be, uh, must have been there already broke out in this, in this first month um, uh, in 1983, um, after uh, the Anschluss. It especially happened in, Aust in, in, in Vienna. I think uh, as there were some incidents also, I know actually in, in Lower Austria, but I think not, uh, there is not much uh, uh, that, that we know um, that it happened uh, it, uh, in, in other uh, parts of Austria. So it was mainly, uh, uh, it mainly happened in Vienna. And, and you actually um, uh, just to to, uh, to 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 also take us. You actually mainly did uh, research uh, in this period, but you focus on 1938, uh, in which uh, also many of the images that we we will see also in the video that we will have a chance to to watch together uh, and then to discuss. Uh, uh, we we see, for example, this image. Uh, it's uh, uh, really an image that seems uh, almost like an objective look, but is uh, really violent. And it's actually the anti-Semitic uh, riots that was in 1938 because it was this uh, uh, clean the Austrofascism before uh, Hitler uh, made uh, enter the troops uh, inside uh, Austria. So this moment uh, it's, uh, was uh, very key for you, for your research, and also the images that we will look afterwards are uh, making this relation. Yes, and uh, now I, give, I come to the answer. Uh, it was quite a long answer because you actually asked me why did I choose the title Österreich ist ein wunderbares Land? And uh, uh, this title I've chosen because um, the, uh, um, the, the declaration, or not the declaration, but the, uh, in the, the new government in 2000, the Green Party and the uh, uh, Turkish, uh, Turkish? No. Austrian People's Party. O Austrian People's Party, Conservative Party, and the Green Party uh, actually uh, wrote in their uh, declaration, uh, um, in, in their contract, um, in the preamble of their contract, they wrote uh, uh, after they agreed to have a correlation, they wrote, uh, Austria is a wonderful country characterized by nature and landscape in diversity and beauty. 
carried by an innov innovative economy located in the heart of Europe, praised for its art and culture and built on its democratic culture and the hard work and engagement of its citizens. Austria is all that. So that's the translation, the English translation of it. And um, I found it quite amazing that in, that in such a paper, uh, it, there is such a strange uh, description of Austria as a country, as a wonderful country. And I think um, it's, it's, it's quite a naive uh, description of, of Austria. And uh, at the same time, unfortunately, uh, we had to, to realize that, uh, of course, uh, the politics, uh, for example, um, how to deal uh, with uh, uh, refugees uh, and, and many other things, immigration politics and so on, uh, that they didn't really uh, essentially change. And uh, therefore, um, I thought, uh, how can we bring this uh, together in, in, in one work? On the one hand, this, uh, this uh, idea of Austria as a wonderful uh, country. Um, and on the other hand, the situation in 1938, when uh, peoples were forced to wash away uh, the slogan Austria on the floor. Um, and this is, uh, and people were cheering. And then also the third layer is uh, the, uh, the Austrian official history politics that for a long time um, considered Austria being the first victim of Nazi Germany. So there were several layers. And I thought actually when you are in the exhibition and uh, you see the film and you have also the historical image, then uh, maybe you think, uh, you start thinking, um, what, how would I react? What would I do in such a situation? Um, when I, when I see these brutalities and uh, subjugation that took place, uh, uh, place during the annexation. I would like to show actually uh, it was people because you prepare for uh, them uh, buckets, you prepare the chalk and uh, here it's uh, some images, uh, uh, some writings and some uh, erasures uh, or this one. Uh, that uh, we could collect uh, from what was uh, possible to see that people actually took this, what you wanted in a certain way and uh, put uh, some reactions. Was this your actually idea also to have uh, uh, interactivity precisely for those who will start to think about the photo because the, the relations uh, uh, between uh, the photograph and the space is uh, uh, also very important. It's a kind of, uh, I will say the photographs function uh, while we are in Vienna and we have Freud like the unconscious of this floor because it's actually uh, bring us back in history. Was this your idea also that you thought maybe people will really start to react to what they see? Actually, what I wanted to um, achieve, so to say, or, or what I wanted to show is, uh, I think uh, it, is a, it, it is a very uncomfortable situation um, to know what has happened uh, in these first days uh, uh, during the annexation, during the Anschluss, and to know that this happened on many places uh, uh, for, uh, in Vienna, and that in the textbooks at school, you often find one photograph uh, of it. So it's not something that is unknown, of course, uh, but on the other hand, uh, a detailed research um, is still ongoing. Uh, what because um, uh, still it's it's it was very difficult to find out at which places uh, this uh, happened, and therefore 
I, uh, I, I wanted to, because also a problem sometimes is um, when you uh, deal or think or examine what has happened during Nazi time or when you see a movie or something like that, um, probably there's often this, this feeling uh, you want to kind of solve it for yourself, you know what I mean? Uh, and you go out of the cinema and then you think about something else or so. And I wanted to, because I'm always uh, very uncomfortable, you know, uh, it is really um, very emotional actually, uh, uh, for me still. Then I also need to make a break when I walk, work on this topic, especially when I work um, about Shoah and, and these atrocities, and also uh, also this so-called Reiperteen. And I actually thought maybe uh, when I uh, make this installation, when I do the installation in this way, that the visitors also feel uncomfortable, uncomfortable, but I think uh, uncomfortable in a good way, because it's not so easy, I think, I mean, it can happen, you never know, but uh, it was not my idea that you just look at it a bit and then say, okay, next work. Uh, uh, actually, there are very good other works in the exhibition. Uh, so, but um, normally it often happens that people uh, run through an exhibition just to see all the works and then they go home. And here I thought maybe there is a moment that and I hope it works worked also uh, for some uh, visitors, visitors at least that there is a moment where you are questioning um, your your own role that you could play in this and also I thought because when there is written Österreich ist ein wunderbares Land and now it's our government that says that actually um, uh, and at the same time uh, Jewish men and women were forced uh, to wash away Österreich. Um, that this uh, is an ambiguous, strange situation you are in. So my idea was not so much, come on, everybody, write something on the floor, mm -hmm. give me your comments and so, because I, f I don't like it, especially in this context, that's too simple. But, and also actually, I, for example, there is nothing in this bucket. There is no water in the bucket. But probably it could have happened that someone took the bucket, filled it with water and washed it away. But at the same time, when you're doing that, you're doing the similar thing that, uh, that the Jewish uh, men and women were forced to do. So it is, there is not really a solution to that problem, actually. This is what I, I maybe wanted to, I wanted to confront uh, the visitor, like I'm also always confronted when I work on this topic, that there is not a solution. I think it's important actually to continue to, to um, uh, think uh, about it. For example, the historian Michaela Ragamblesch, who really helped me in the research. She's an expert, especially on this topic. And I also asked her in our first meeting that, that I'm still, I have not, not a, an, an answer why this happened in this form. Yes. Um, I, 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 and, and she said, this is also something she, she still uh, can't understand it. And I don't mean, I mean, there are many things we don't understand. I mean it more literally. I, I can't understand why there, there is a, a mother or a father with his child and holding the shoulder around it while they are watching this, like it, it would be a performance. And actually it was really brutal. I mean, this was not normal soap. This was uh, this this hurt the the hands. Um, it was it was uh, horrible, and and um, and everyone who watched it knew it, and no one has ever heard that anyone ever really interfered into. There is one example actually that we found where it happened in a way. This is also in the movie at the end. Um, uh, this this uh, scene. Um, where, but this woman was actually from England and, and she interfered in such a right party um, or she had a background. She was living in Indiana at this time. So, um, and, then, uh, and then also, but still I, I left some of this, uh, uh, what's the name of it? The white... Uh, um, the chalk, the chalk. 
talk <laughs> some of these jokes. And actually, interestingly, some people, although you don't really see it, It's just small jokes that, that are left. Uh, some people had obviously wanted to add something because there were not jokes laying there and uh, there was not uh, a manual <laughs> written, use the jokes and write your statement. Uh, so there were just these small pieces laying around and, and actually interestingly, people, some people used it to write uh, something. And they were, as far as I saw the comments, questioning uh, the slogan, Österreich ist ein wunderbares Land, which is a strange uh, slogan in the context of, I mean, it's not strange when you do it for, for tourists and you want that many tourists come, but it's strange when the new government declares that in the beginning, uh, without in, the, uh, in this preamble, there is not any critical insight which I think is, is necessary. So it's a strange, strange form of patriotism. Yes, I think uh, you, you actually was very precise in explaining this, uh, and also you gave us this dimension, uh, I will say also of affectivity and being affected as you as artist, Uh, not only on the other side, but also in the way why to do these things and what are the expectations that I think is uh, uh, very important for such type of the works. And also what were the possible uh, things that can happen. Even more, uh, that is, uh, uh, this slogan is still valuable because we are still in uh, the slogan that will last until the 2024. So it's a, a super actual work. I will say, because practically the way of uh, uh, unearthing uh, what is uh, made invisible or it's not thought of, I think it's one of your most important, uh, let's say concept, how you work. You work actually, you dig, and we will see now in the video, but I, maybe just a, a few, uh, few words if you can explain, because you have this really uh, very um, uh, straightforward, deeply, uh, deep, uh, deeply way of going to the bottom of the things, uh, uh, already collecting, making the research, the changes, the connections, the people who you consulted and so on, like maybe an idea for us before we enter the video and start to watch. How, yes. The system. Yes, uh, so in, in the movie that is unfortunately only a way label in German uh, language at the moment, Uh, and there are German subtitles, and I did this intentionally uh, because I really wanted um, the Viennese people also to be confronted. Uh, and I think that with the German subtitles, uh, it is even easier to follow uh, the, the quotes because the whole uh, film is based on original quotes from eyewitness reports And also a part are image descriptions of historical images that I actually did. Um, uh, and so there are, uh, of course, um, there, there are uh, quotes of uh, victims, but there are also quotes uh, of um, uh, Not of passers by. I didn't find any uh, of. There are quotes of passers by, but not of uh, ones who cheered uh, and and uh, who laughed uh, about this uh, event. Um, this I couldn't find. Um, uh, maybe it doesn't really exist. Uh, um, but uh, there the, there are uh, of course quotes of of of, of witnesses um, who witnessed. Uh, when, when Hitler uh, arrived and when the Nazis arrived and yeah, the, how, how they uh, were impressed by that and, and fanatic uh, to, uh, to welcome uh, Hitler and the Nazis in, in Vienna. And this, you have these quotes and uh, it's a very sensitive uh, topic actually. And I, I also decided only to use quotes um, so there is not a real fictional component in the film. 
because I thought it's actually enough, but I worked very hard uh, on the film for, for a long time, I have to say, because then uh, we shot, uh, so we filmed, um, uh, the, the video is made of shots of places in Vienna where the event took place. It was also not so easy to find out uh, all, where all these places and how they look nowadays. And there are main, two main narrative uh, figures that perform in the video, they are actors. So one is more or less more in the role of a reporter. Um, it's not so strict, I have to say, but it was the idea behind. And uh, it's Anne-Marie Lang, an, an actor who is actually in the Book Theater Ensemble. And she uh, she's also from Hungary. So she has this special accent. And, uh, and she is reading statements um, by witnesses. And uh, at the moment when a witness, you will realize when you see the film, in the moment when a witness, uh, in, in the quote of the witness, there is an I, when the, when the witness speaks about himself, when it says, I did this or that, then um, she stops reading it and uh, recites it by heart. Um, and then the other uh, contemporary witness, so to say, the other person uh, is Peter Rothkappel, also an actor. And he is also uh, reading uh, the, the statements of uh, uh, passers-by. Then there is some mix sometimes. You will see that it's not so strict. Um, so he also reads uh, other statements in the end from, from, uh, from also people who can be considered. So he's not only reading statements from, from Nazis or, or people who uh, yeah, uh, were rooted for the, for the Nazis. Um, and, and as I said, they appear in the video at historically contam contaminated locations and uh, talk about the events that have happened. Uh, precisely, uh, uh, it, 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 um, it, um, so you see the place and you hear them speaking. And uh, then there is a, th a, a third layer. So Anne-Marie Lang, she's talking, uh, I did it a bit, um, I misspoke uh, a bit. Anne-Marie Lang uh, speaks not uh, the statements, re recites not the statements of the people, of the Jewish people who are describing what has happened to them when they were forced to clean the streets. She also, she is, for example, um, uh, quoting Gidi, an, a journalist who at this time was in Austria and described, describes the event, because I was thinking there must be another layer, another form of representation for these quotes that actually describe from the personal view, the personal experience, what has happened uh, to these uh, people that were forced to clean the streets, to, uh, to, to clean the streets. And therefore, I had this, this great opportunity um, that uh, Susanne Bock, who uh, herself had to flee Austria and uh, Vienna at this time, um, that she actually recites uh, or, or she speaks, she's as an off voice, um, she, uh, she um, speaks these quotes uh, by the victims, so to say. Um, and, um, and this is an off voice, um, and you will uh, realize in the video uh, why this is uh, so important, this differentiation between the different voices um, in the film, um, and maybe we, we, you can actually conclude uh, also mentioning Robert Halpern. Yes, and, and uh, actually then uh, I have, during the research, uh, I actually had the uh, uh, opportunity, it was a great honor actually, also to interview Robert Halpern. And this will be a kind of epilogue in the film where he also um, talks about his own experience, and unfortunately, uh, he passed away uh, one uh, month or a few weeks later. 
So this was really the latest uh, thing, the latest uh, interview that has been done um, with him. Um, and unfortunately, he he couldn't uh, see the exhibition. That was also due Corona then for not possible for Susanne Bock, who is of course also in that age. So this is also a film maybe about the last uh, people that still live and can talk about what has happened. Um, yeah, but I don't want to talk too much now. Yes. But I just did it on purpose because maybe someone in the audience doesn't speak German and cannot now uh, see the film uh, or understand the film. But for all these uh, participants here, I can offer uh, that you just uh, contact uh, Sophie Uitz, and um, we will tell you later how. And as soon as there is an English ver version available with English subtitles, then uh, we will send you a link, then you can look it, um, you can watch it afterward. Okay, uh, thanks for now this part, uh, Martin. We, we will go uh, into watching the video uh, that is long, uh, uh, 32 minutes. And after that, we will come back because of your fantastic introduction also in this part. Uh, I think uh, after we come back, we talk very shortly and give the possibility to people in German also ask questions uh, and also uh, directly talk with you uh, and uh, actually uh, this is maybe even the most important point of this talk today that they can ask you and uh, confront and they can of course talk in German. So this will be my suggestion. Let's go with the film. Österreich ist ein wunderbares Land, geprägt von Natur und Landschaft in Vielfalt und Schönheit, getragen von einer innovativen Wirtschaft, gelegen im Herzen Europas, gerühmt für seine Kunst und Kultur und gebaut auf seine demokratische Kultur und dem Fleiß und Engagement seiner Bürgerinnen und Bürger. All das macht Österreich aus. Und in den Märztagen 1938 war es soweit, dass die Leute auf die Straße gegangen sind. Überall sind auf einmal die Hakenkreuzfahnen aufgetaucht. Wo die das hergenommen haben, war sogar mir unverständlich. Es sind im Bundeskanzleramt schon illegale SS-Postenwache gestanden. Wir hätten gar nicht mehr den Einmarsch der deutschen Wehrmacht gebraucht. Als Nationalsozialist, der ich seit Jahren illegal gearbeitet habe, will ich Sie auf Vorkommnisse in unserer Stadt aufmerksam machen. Ich bin mit meinem Chef an einem der letzten Abende durch die Taborstraße gegangen. Da standen anscheinend vor jüdischen Geschäften Juden mit Tafeln in der Hand, versehen mit der Aufschrift, Aria, kauft nicht bei Juden. Ist das Nationalsozialismus? Weiters begegnete ich einem Trupp SA-Leuten, die mehrere zusammengefangene Juden in ihrer Mitte führten. Auf mein Befragen erhielt ich die Antwort, dass diese Juden für verschiedene Reibearbeiten verwendet werden. Ist das Nationalsozialismus? Ich kann nicht umhin zu erwähnen, dass damals einfach alles eine ganze Welt 
für mich und meinesgleichen, also für alle Juden in Österreich, ganz gleich, welcher politischen Richtung sie angehörten, welches politische Bekenntnis sie hatten, welcher sozialen Schicht sie sich zurechneten, von heute auf morgen zusammenbrach. Es haben sich sofort in der Nacht vom 11. auf den 12. März fürchterliche Szenen abgespielt. Da waren auch schon die ersten Leute, die den Gehsteig reiben mussten. Einem Herrn, der dunkelhaarig war und eine etwas kräftigere, größere Nase hatte, wurde von einem Nazi, der noch nicht in Uniform war, aber schon die Armbinde gehabt hat, eine Ohrfeige gegeben, so dass die Brille in hohem Bogen wegflog. Dabei rief er, du Saujud, dir werde ich was geben. Der Mann hat seine Brille liegen gelassen. Er dürfte ein ziemlicher Sportler gewesen sein, denn er hat den am Krawattel gepackt, hat ihm links und rechts eine geschmiert und gesagt, ich bin kein Jud, auch kein Saujud. Aber für die Ohrfeige, die du vielleicht einem Juden gegeben hättest und die du mir gegeben hast, kriegst du jetzt zwei zurück. Der Nazi war sprachlos. Obgleich eine augenscheinliche Nebensächlichkeit im Vergleich mit den anderen Handlungen unter dem neuen Regime hatte durch die tiefste Wirkung auf die jüdische Bevölkerung das erzwungene Reiben von Gehsteigen, Waschen von Kasernen etc. Es beraubte die Juden jeden Gefühls persönlicher Sicherheit und ihres Glaubens an die Menschlichkeit des Nachbarn. An jenem Tag hielten mich Polizeisperren auf, weil junge Nationalsozialisten vor der Oper auftrugen. Heil Hitler, brüllten sie. Fragend wandte ich mich an einen der Polizisten. Der zuckte die Achseln, aber ein zweiter sah mich plötzlich scharf an. Als ich im Café Herrenhof auftauchte, fand ich die Freunde besorgt. Die Heil-Hitler-Rufe drangen wie ununterbrochenes Hundegekläff zu uns herein. Auch die Polizisten sind Nazis, flüsterte ich atemlos und verstummte, weil der Ober zu uns trat. Was darf sein, fragte er wie immer. Ich bestellte eine Schale Gold, nur Kaffee, denn der Appetit war mir vergangen. Am Ring also eine viel, viel zehntausendköpfige Menge. Ein großes Geschrei und eine Begeisterung. In den Blumenkörben oben auf den Lampenmasten, hingegossen wie in Clubsesseln, saßen die jungen Leute. Auf eine große Limousine wurden auch Vera und ich hinaufbuxiert. Zwei Männer in armseligster Arbeiterkleidung rutschten von ihren Sitzen herab und unter viel Beifall und Geschrei wurden Vera und ich gezogen, am allerwertesten nachgeschoben, ebenfalls auf das Wagendach gehisst. Sprechchöre tönten auf, die so richtig Wiener Hamur sind. Schuschnik war unser Führer, das Volk war immer dürrer, die Juden immer fetter, heil Hitler, uns am Retter.
an jenem Abend des 11. März drängten sich bereits um 20 Uhr so viele Flüchtlinge auf den Perro, dass sie den Zug vollkommen gefüllt hätten. Dann kamen die SA-Leute, nur halb uniformiert, bloß halb bewaffnet, aber alle mit den gefürchteten Hakenkreuzbindern angetan, siegestrunken, heiße vor Siegesgebrüll und dürsten nach Rache. Mit Hundepeitschen in der Hand gingen sie von Waggon zu Waggon und zwangen Männer, Frauen und Kinder wieder auszusteigen. Wie viel wurden diese vom Bahnsteig weg ins Gefängnis getrieben? Ich war 17,5 Jahre alt, als ich meinen Vater das letzte Mal sah. Wir waren am Bahnhof, als der Zug, in dem wir über die tschechoslowakische Grenze zu fliehen hofften, versiegelt nach Wien retourniert wurde. Mein Vater wurde sofort verhaftet. Mein Bruder und ich durften nach Hause gehen. Passt mir auf die Mutti gut auf, sagte er, als wir uns weinend umarmten. Und seid schön brav. Unsere Mutter, die schon die ganze Nacht auf einen Anruf aus der Tschechoslowakei gewartet hatte und am nächsten Tag abreisen sollte, wurde totenbleich, als wir allein nach Hause kamen. Die erste Reibparty sah ich auf dem Praterstern. Sie musste das Bild Schuschnicks entfernen, das mit einer Schablone auf den Sockel eines Monuments gemalt worden war. SA-Leute schleppten einen bejahrten jüdischen Arbeiter und seine Frau durch die Ballfallklatschende Menge. Tränen rollten der alten Frau über die Wange. Und während sie starr vor sich hinsah, und förmig durch ihre Peiniger hindurchblickte, konnte ich sehen, wie der alte Mann, dessen Arm sich hielt, versuchte, ihre Hand zu streicheln. Arbeit für die Juden! Endlich Arbeit für die Juden! Heute die Menge. Wir danken unserem Führer. Er hat Arbeit für die Juden geschafft. Ich fing Fragmente eines Gespräches auf, das ein untersetzter Nazi mit einer Gruppe führte. Eine hat einen Pelzmantel angehabt, wie wir sie aus dem Kaffeehaus holten. Und natürlich hat sie auch lackierte Fingernägel gehabt. Nachdem sie eine Stunde gerieben hatte, nahm ich sie mir hoch und ließ sie den Leuten ihre markierten Nägel zeigen. Also, ich kann euch sagen, die haben gut ausgesehen. Es werden hübsch ein paar Monate vergehen bevor sie ihre Hände wieder beim Bridge zeigen darf. Es war direkt neben dem Café Gartenbrauch. Als ich damals vorbeiging, sah ich von Weitem viele Leute stehen, lachend und grölend. Das Ganze war damals für viele Wiener ein Riesenspaß. Ich sah einige alte, bärtige Männer, Juden natürlich, kniehend mit Kübeln und Fetzen, die von narzisstischen Rüppeln, jung und alt, angetrieben wurden. Ich verstand sofort, was da vor sich ging und wechselte auf die andere Straßenseite, um der Sache aus dem Weg zu gehen. Das nützte mir selbstverständlich gar nichts. Auch auf dieser Seite standen einige der lieben Wiener mit Hakenkreuzbinden am Arm. Weil sie bemerkten, dass ich so plötzlich ausweichte, kam sofort die Frage, bist du Jud? Ich antwortete mit Ja. Also brachte man mich auf die andere Seite. Schon hatte ich auch einen Kübel, Fetzen und Bürste in der Hand und durfte die Straße reinigen.
Wir waren begeistert vom Hitler, der Führer. Das war für uns ein Idol, ein Gott. Der Führer kommt. Und wie er dann einmal nach Österreich gekommen ist, bin ich zwei Tage lang überhaupt nicht heimgekommen. Wie sie Österreich annektiert haben, sozusagen. Da sind die deutschen Truppen einmarschiert und der Führer hat dann am Heldenplatz gesprochen. Und da sind wir zwei Tage drinnen gestanden, damit man irgendwo einen Platz kriegt, wo man hinsehen kann. Der war für uns ein Gott, ein Idol. Als Hitler inmitten in seiner Wagenkrone vorbeiglitt und die Heichrufe zum Gewitterdonner anschwollen, versuchte ich in den Augen dieser Menschen zu lesen. Ich sah, wie Frauen, die sich in die vordersten Reihen vorgedenkt hatten, in einer Art Krampf der Ekstase die Augen vertieten. Ich sah den Ausdruck vollständiger Entpersönlichung der Gesichter in einem blinden Rausch, das mythisch narkotisierte Wesen der Masse, die sich nicht anderes wünscht, als unterworfen zu werden. Als ich über den Graben ging, sah ich auch die berüchtigten Szenen, als man Juden mit Kübeln voll scharfer Lauge dazu gezwungen hat, auf den Knien rutschend die Gehsteige und Straßen von den Schuschnick und Österreich-Parolen, den vielen Krokenkreuzen und so weiter zu reinigen. Um diese sogenannten Reibpartien sind die Menschen herumgestanden und haben gelacht, haben gespottet, gespuckt, sogar mit den Füßen getreten. In Deutschland hat es den bodenreibenden Juden von 1933 bis 1945 nicht gegeben. Das war, und das sage ich, obwohl ich eine überzeugte Wienerin bin, eine Erfindung der Österreicher, vor allem der Wiener. Jeden Morgen erhielt die SS-Abteilung in der Habsburger Gasse Weisung, wie viele Juden sie an dem Tag für solche Reinigungsarbeiten zusammenfangen sollte. Eines Tages sah ich auf dem Graben eine Engländerin, die von zwei Freunden von einer dieser abstoßenden Szenen weggezogen wurde. Lass mich los! Ich muss dem ein Ende machen! rief sie. Aber zu ihrem Glück hatte sie die Nazis nicht gehört, weil sie mit ihren Vergnügungen zu sehr beschäftigt waren. Die Pestsäule war schwarz von begeisterten Zuschauern. Elfe und ich gingen in die Stadt. Am Graben einer der schönsten Straßen Wiens begegneten wir einer Gruppe von Männern in braunen Uniformen mit Hakenkreuz anbinden, um die eine Menge von Wienern herumstand, von denen viele lachten. Als wir näher kamen, sah ich mitten im Gedränge ein Dutzend Menschen mittleren Alters, Männer und Frauen, die auf ihren Knien das Straßenpflaster mit Zahnbürsten putzten. Einen davon kannte ich, Dr. Berggrün, unser Kinderarzt, der mir das Leben gerettet hatte, als ich im Alter von vier Jahren Diphtherie hatte. Ich frage die Männer in Uniform, was sie hier täten. Waren sie verrückt geworden? Was fällt ihnen ein, brüllt einer von ihnen. Was fällt ihnen ein, brülle ich zurück und ließ ihn wissen, dass einer der Männer, die sie gerade erniedrigten, ein bedeutender Arzt sei, ein Lebensretter. Da rief Elfe in ihrer ganzen Schönheit mit ihrer glockenhellen 
ausgebildeten Stimme ist das, was Sie jetzt unsere Befreiung nennen. Es war außergewöhnlich. Innerhalb von zwei Minuten löste sich die höhnische Menschenansammlung auf. Die braunen Wachen waren verschwunden, die Straßenreiniger verschmolzen mit den Passanten. Tun Sie das nie wieder, sagte Dr. Berggrün in strengem Ton zu uns. Seine kleine, runde Frau neben ihm nickte dazu heftig. Ihr Gesicht ganz eingefallen vor Verzweiflung und Erschöpfung. Es ist sehr gefährlich. Sie vergaßen beide 1943 in Sobibor. Wir haben uns gestellt auf Ecke Neubaugasse und Marie-Hilfer-Straße und haben geschrien, Heil Österreich. Und die haben geschrien, Heil Hitler. Aber wir haben keinen Anklang gefunden. Wann ich resigniert habe, war, wie der einmarschiert ist und wie ich gesehen habe, die Menschen, die da stehen und wie er bejubelt worden ist. An derselben Stelle auf der maria straße wird ein paar Tage später ein Mann von einer kleinen Gruppe von Nazis gezwungen, ein Schild mit der Aufschrift »Dieses arme Schwein kauft bei Juden ein« vor sich herzutragen. In der Gruppe befinden sich neben einem Mann in SA-Uniform einige Personen in Zivil. Rechts neben dem SA-Mann geht ein in Anzug, Krawatte, Hut und Mantel gekleideter Mann. An seiner linken Seite eine Frau, die drei Personen blicken in Richtung Kamera, der Mann in Zivil lacht breit. Die Gruppe zieht am Hotel Kuma vorbei. An dessen Fassade in übergroßen Lettern der Spruch Ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer prangt. Es begann der Raub des jüdischen Vermögens. Seit den ersten Tagen begannen uniformierte und nicht uniformierte Nazis jüdische Geschäfte zu plündern. Auch in Privatwohnungen wurde nachgeschaut. Dabei wurde Wäsche, Kleider, Schmuck, Pelze, Teppiche, Radioapparate, kurz alles, was nicht nied- und nagelfest war, mitgenommen. Erpressungen jeder Art waren auf der Tagesordnung. In der Heinerstraße, auf der Höhe Taborstraße, müssen im März 1938 Juden ein am Asphalt aufgemaltes Kruckenkreuz, Symbol des autoritären Stern des Staats Österreich, mit kleinen Bürsten entfernen. Die Fotografie zeigt einen Ausschnitt des Geschehens. Während die meisten Fotografien von anderen sogenannten Reitpartien von oben herab aufgenommen wurden, entstand dieses Bild aus einem besonders tiefen Kamerawinkel, der die Gesichter der Schaulustigen ausspart und die Perspektive der Opfer einnimmt. Deutlich zu erkennen ist, wie die Hände der Gedemütigten bereits von Straßendreck verfärbt sind. Unter dem Beifall der Wiener Bevölkerung werden am 14. März 1938 in der Novara-Gasse, Höhe Weintraubengasse, 
Juden und Jüdinnen gezwungen, Knie an die Straße von den Parolen des Ständestaates zu reinigen. Die Menge der Schaulustigen ist dicht einander gedrängt. Einige müssen den Kopf weit nach oben recken, um einen Blick auf das Szenario erheischen zu können. Andere klettern auf Sockel und Vorsprünge einer Häuserwand, um von weiter hinten das Geschehen überblicken zu können. Ein weiteres Foto dieses Ereignisses zeigt, in welch großer Anzahl sich die Wiener und Wienerinnen hier zum Gaffen versammelt haben. Entschlossen halten Männer und Frauen in der ersten Reihe einander an den Händen, um den Rest der Menge nach hinten zu drängen. Zwei kleine Kinder legen ihre Köpfe zwischen die verschränkten Arme. Einige Gesichter der Schaulustigen offenbaren unverhohlene Schadenfreude. In der Mühlfeldgasse 7 findet am 14. März 1938 ebenfalls eine sogenannte Reibparty statt. Vier Hände sind zum deutschen Gruß erhoben. Ein österreichischer Nazi mit Hakenkreuzbinde blickt in die Kamera. In der Hagemüller Gasse läuft am 15. März über die ganze Straße ätzende Lauge, in welcher Menschen Knie an die Straße reinigen müssten. Bewacht wird diese Reibparty von vier SA-Männern. Entlang der Häuserfronten, gedrängt stehend, beobachten die Wiener und Wienerinnen die öffentliche Demütigung. In der Nachkriegszeit zeigten die Opfer den Anführer dieser Aktion, Josef Rettschneider, an. Das Foto wurde seinerzeit von einem Familienangehörigen eines Opfers gemacht und diente nach 1945 als Beweis vor Gericht. Wir sehen auf dem Foto fünf Männer, die die Straße schubben mussten. Der zweite von rechts mit hochgekrempeltem Hemd ist Rudolf Stern, dessen Zeugenaussage uns überliefert ist. Als ich vor dem Realgymnasium Wien 3 Hagen-Müller-Gasse ankam, sah ich dort meine Freunde. Auch sie hatten Kübel und Bürsten. Im Gänsemarsch wurden wir durch die Reihen der spalierstehenden, interessierten Zuschauer in die Häuser geführt, um unsere Kübel mit Wasser zu füllen, was wir im Laufe der darauffolgenden Arbeit häufig wiederholten. Ich habe damals volle drei Stunden lang gerieben, zusammen mit den anderen. Von jener Reibeaktion kam ich damals mit wunden Knien heim und hatte Schmerzen bei der leisesten Berührung. Links vor Rudolf Stern kniet der Heinrich Schiederter, neben ihm muss Heinrich Saffirstein die Straße schuben. Auch von ihm existierte eine Aussage zu dem Geschehen. Einige Tage nach Einmarsch der deutschen Truppen in Österreich, im März 1938, kam in das Geschäft meiner Eltern, Schlachthausgasse 37, ein mir bekannter, in Erdberg wohnhafter Nazi, seines Berufs Kapskutscher, mit Hakenkreuz Armbinde versehen und forderte mich auf, meinen besten Anzug anzuziehen, Kübel und Bürste zu nehmen und ihm zu folgen. Ich weigerte mich jedoch und verlangte, auf die Polizeiwachstube geführt zu werden, um zu erfahren, ob der Mann das Recht habe, mit mir so zu verfahren. Der wachhabende Beamte telefonierte mit dem Gasthaus Haag, Erdbergstraße, wo sich damals der Sitz der Erdbeer Nazis befand. Es wurde ihm geantwortet, 
dass der Mann mit der Armbinde von ihnen den Auftrag erhalten habe, mich zu holen und dass ich zu folgen habe. So musste ich mit sechs anderen in Erdberg wohnhaften Juden mit Kübel und Bürsten versehen, Wahlparolen vom Pflaster entfernen. Diese zwei Stunden hindurch unter den Stößen und Tritten der uns bewachenden Nazis, alle Erdberger, und zum größten Vergnügen der Zuschauer, die uns von Straße zu Straße folgten. Am nächsten Tage wurde ich zu derselben Arbeit geholt, diesmal für drei Stunden. Ist es doch lustig, muss er ebenfalls die Straße waschen. Ist allerdings auf dieser Foto nicht zu sehen. Ich wurde aufgefordert, meinen besten Anzug anzuziehen und mit dem mich abholenden SA-Mann mitzukommen. Ich wurde nebst Juden aus der Umgebung wie Löwenheck, Neumann, Stein, Saphirstein, Scherata, Halpern, der ein Invalide aus dem Ersten Weltkrieg war, mit Bürsten und Kübeln ausgerüstet, auf Lastautos verladen und in die umliegenden Gassen zum Reiben geführt. Typisch für die halbherzige Entnazifizierung und die mangelhafte juristische Überführung der NS-Täter und Täterinnen in Österreich, wo der Brettschneider zwar im Mai 1950 aufgrund dieser Tat und seiner illegalen Mitgliedschaft in der NSDAP zu 18 Monaten Haft verurteilt, aber bereits im selben Jahr im Zuge der Weihnachtsamnestie begnadigt und entlassen. Die Welt hat sich völlig verändert. Die Menschen waren wie Raubtiere. Und dann ist er, ohne anzuklopfen, hereingekommen. Er hat gesagt, das nehme ich mit, das nehme ich mit. Und dann hat er zu mir gesagt, und du kommst mit. Wir sind da rausgegangen und er hat gesagt, jetzt gehen wir, wir müssen den Boden waschen, weil morgen sieht der Führer ein und so weiter, das muss alles sauber sein. Wo ist dein Vater? Ich sage, mein Vater ist im Ausland. Also ich muss nur mitkommen für ihn. Ich war damals 17, so knapp 17. Da hat man gezeigt, im Motorrad, damals war es nicht so selbstverständlich. Und er hat gesagt, das habe ich beschlagnahmt, Ach, nicht, nicht einmal, arisiert war das Wort. Das habe ich mir jetzt arisiert und ich soll jetzt ihm putzen, dass es sauber ist. Und jetzt bin ich gesessen und habe einige Stunden geputzt und mit allen möglichen Dingen. Also es war immer von mir, dass ich jetzt ins KZ kommen werde. Und ich habe schon gewusst, was, was im KZ passiert.
Uh, yeah, Martin, before we uh, really give the words to Sophie to take uh, the plateau into German uh, language because of the possible, and I hope, I hope uh, questions and also remarks, I want to ask you uh, something and I want to actually make a comment. First, every time that I work, watch this uh, work, I, I think it's a remarkable way how you did it. And I mean, honestly, really remarkable because you give the materiality and the presence to historical monument in such a strong way that uh, practically after watching this, it's almost impossible to think about Vienna in a different way. Every step brings us back, but also opens the question of the future. And uh, uh, also the way uh, how you link the materials, the engagement, I really, I think it's really astonishing. I want to be very clear and to say this. And my question will be uh, the work that you did, the, the, the research, but also the uh, recordings and the editing afterwards, because everything is there. We can see this unbelievable dramaturgy. Uh, uh, when, how was uh, this process? Uh, how how long? I think it's very long because it's part of also of your back work. But how you engage? in making this work actually to this final form with uh, Robert Halpern, absolutely the most needed epilogue ever. So just uh, to, 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 to open then for the discussion. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your comment, Marina. That also means much to me because you are known as a very, very critical person. And um, so this really means much to me um, yes, uh, the dramaturgy was very important for me, actually, because it's such a serious topic and you cannot just uh, add quote on quote. I think you have to be careful when you concentrate uh, and you only want to use quote. This was then a decision. So there is quotes from, uh, from the survivors, so to say. There is quotes uh, from, from the population and there, there are quotes from journalists and there are image quotes, so to say, so historical images, which I then describe. So this is text that I have written, but this text is uh, very objective. There is no subjective description of the photographs. In the beginning, actually, I did it, but then I realized I, I sh should not do that. Uh, I, I tried to be as objective and precise as possible and for me, it was also important not uh, to have uh, movement when showing the photos. So these are all conscious decisions. Also, that it is, it is quite dense. I think the film is uh, there is very much information. For me, still, it's, it is very emotional. I don't know how this is for the visitors. Maybe because I knew Robert Halpern personally only for such a short time, and I also then heard afterward and. Uh, yeah, uh, I stop now about this. Uh, so, and also with Susanne Box. So, this, there is this personal relation on one hand. And then there is also when I, for me, this is the strongest thing. Uh, actually, when I hear or when I read um, uh, what uh, eyewitnesses experienced, this is also this for me because, but because there is so much authenticity in it. Although sometimes you remember something differently as it actually happened, but still uh, uh, this is very touching for me. So, for, so with respect to the dramaturgy, um, I had first uh, did a lot of research and I have made, my, although it's difficult to get all these quotes, to find all these quotes in the several books. There's also a book list in the exhibition where you see all the sources where the quotes are taken from. Um, uh, but first I made a, um, I made a script. I, I did a script and, and tried to organize uh, this statement so that it makes sense uh, uh, in the dramaturgy. And then we did the actual filming. And this was also very difficult, as you remember, because it is, uh, happened in summer where Corona was not so strong and it was 
possible to get the permissions to film actually because also not so easy uh, and uh, but uh, it was still we didn't know will it happen or will it not happen so we did all the preparation and uh, Anne Maria actually had to come from Buda Budapest <clears throat> She lives in Budapest and is also working in Vienna at the Burgtheater. So at this time, of course, not because Burgtheater was closed. So all these these things were also uh, I would also like uh, to mention, and also the camera team and so on. And then uh, finally, we uh, started uh, and 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 we did it in two days because there was not much budget. Um, also, although you tried. But we, we all, also for the whole exhibition, there was not much budget. And because this was, uh, there was not much time, it's not like another film project where you have two or three years and you try to get all the money because it takes, yeah, you all, you know that it takes ages uh, uh, to have money to do a proper film, even a documentary. So this was made with nearly, yeah, not much money, so to say. At least the actors could be paid and the camera team and so on. But uh, then, uh, uh, okay, and then we did the filming in two days. And then uh, suddenly I got the opportunity by, via personal contact to meet Robert Halpern. And I told you I have this great opportunity, but I don't know if I will do any filming with him. Uh, I just will meet him and it's, it's a, it is really a, a great possibility. And uh, and he actually from the beginning wanted that that I do the fi filming immediately, and he agreed to the concept and the film. That was really yeah amazing that this happened. <laughs> so uh, and also uh, similarly, um, uh, shortly before the filming um, started, I had the great opportunity uh, to work with Susanne Bock who herself agreed, she also wrote a book about her personal experience um, when she uh, fled Austria. And in the beginning, when you see her, she's reading a quote of her own book. Uh, that's also why you see her, but also I wanted actually that the audience sees her. Uh, first, I thought not, and in the end, uh, you see her. So this is our all questions of dramaturgy because she's such, I mean, she is such an amazing person. And then shortly afterward, it was not possible to visit her anymore because of Corona time. But unfortunately, she has got her vaccination now, so I hope I can meet her again. I know her for a longer time already. Um, um, the family context of my wife. Uh, but uh, that was, uh, that was uh, then I had this, uh, this material and I looked at it, the, the film material and also what, the, what I filmed, the short film I did with Robert Hypern and, and, and I started the editing and uh, exactly as the script said, and I thought, okay, Robert Hypern will be in the epilogue. Uh, his part will be in the epilogue. I will not mix him in uh, the film because this is something special. It's something different. And, and then I finished it editing and then I looked at it and it was horrible. I, I couldn't, it didn't work at all. Uh, the script uh, was, did not work visually. <laughs> the script worked when we, because you also were reading the script before I did the filming, but then visually it didn't work. It was too chaotic actually, because I mixed everything. I mixed the historical images um, of the places uh, where the so-called Rappertin uh, happened uh, also in, in the middle of the film or in the beginning. And I started to re, uh, um, reorganize actually the film. Uh, so this was really hard work, I have to say. And it's, it's also funny, there is some, for example, you have these black and white images and a shortly, uh, and, and, and then a shortly break. So a still image, it's black and white. And then you have the description, and then there's the description of the person um, the quote is from, uh, of, of the witness. And this small decision helped a lot uh, to follow the film. Before that, I had subtitles and I had then in between uh, this, uh, this um, references to the, to, the, to the quote, to the person who spoke. And all these small decisions, it took me a really long time this time, I have to say. And then I showed it to several people and I got the feedback and, and then finally 
yeah, I, I think I'm I'm quite. Um, I think it's okay how how the result now. Uh, I think it works. Ho hopefully, <laughs> I th I must say really works. Not because we are talking and now we are leaving the words to the audience, but it's really working because in such um, uh, uh, precarious format, this is a video film, and also it's true. It's important to say it was a small budget. You make a, a remarkable research, but what is more important, you gave the materiality to each of these uh, documentary material when looking this as i said every uh, step in vienna uh, after this uh, looking this work it's another story you understand that everything is actually lost any kind of innocent and you have to remember this very clearly because you feel this materiality. And I think that Anne Maria Lang is very important because shows that what happened in Austria, anti-Semitism, Shoah, it's not something here. It's actually a cause for everybody. And this is very good that Anne Marie Lang is actually reading this internationalized in a certain way, something that could be just a cause here. No, it's for all of us. So with this, now I think we, we, we stop for a second and I give the word to Sophie, which that in German opened the possibility for people to be more easy to ask questions and comment. Sophie? Yeah, hello. Um, uh, I, I, I guess I will keep talking in English or I'll switch back and forth. Ähm, äh, herzlich willkommen jetzt auch verspätet noch von meiner Seite und äh, danke Martin Krenn ähm, für diese Veranstaltung heute. Ähm, äh, we have posted it in the beginning in the chat. If you have any questions, um, this is the moment to ask them and you can write them into the chat in Deutsch or in English. And then I will relay them to Martin and we can really speak either in German or in English. Martin also um, for you, if there is anything else you would like to add, this is also... Yeah, there are, two, there are two things I'd like to mention. Uh, one thing is that I was also inspired by a work uh, by Ruth Beckerman uh, called The Missing Image that she has realized 2015 um, in Vienna. And actually it's an addition to... Um, to um, Mahnmal, to a um, uh, memorial um, uh, that was made by Alfred Rydlitschka. And one part of this memorial is a small statue that should uh, represent the so-called street washing Jew. So it's already a topic uh, in, 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 in the memory politics, so to say. Um, but uh, uh, but it's also very strange and uh, because then tourists were sitting on this statue, for example. So, uh, but I don't want to tell the whole story. What is really important is that she put uh, 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 two uh, monitors in front of this statue. And on these monitors, you saw a sh very short film loop of actually people watching uh, the uh, such an uh, such an event uh, happening and also laughing and, and so on moving so they uh, so you were eye to eye with with the visitor at this time so she edited um, because it's also a kind of victimization again what Alfred Hitlitschka did uh, so there's a lot of discussion around it it's also not so easy to answer so to say but uh, I was inspired by that and the second work I was very much uh, inspired is by Gustav Metzger who died a few years ago a, a great conceptual concept artist and uh, his work I actually showed as a curator um, many years ago in a traveling exhibition that I did together with Andrea Domesle. His work is called To Crawl Into and it's a blanket, a large blanket on the floor and you have to crawl into this uh, blanket and then you see a very large um, uh, um, print of one of, of, of these photos uh, showing the, how the Jewish people, showing Jewish people that were forced uh, to clean the streets. So 
um, uh, and and so so as a visitor, you have to crawl into this, and then you don't really see it. But because it's such an important historical image, maybe because it's already in your memory, you start to realize actually what is under the blanket. It's also very strong work because also um, there is, I think, for me, uh, uh, this the, uh, my interpretation is you sweep uh, something under the carpet or there is something under the blanket hidden. Uh, and he had very interesting works dealing with historical images, actually. And I was also inspired, in a way, uh, by this work when when I did this um, installation that you uh, that you are kind of part of the installation when you are uh, when you are standing there and you have the text written um, and, and and watch the film. Yes. Which, uh, which as a concept was something that you were very early on um, uh, uh, already convinced that, that you would do in your installation. Ah, jetzt ist eine Frage da. Um, um, ich lese die Frage vor. Dear Martin, thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. I've probably missed your previous explanation why you chose the narrator with the Hungarian accent. Could you please repeat it again? Thank you. Yes, uh, actually, I chose uh, uh, the, the actor and uh, also Marina helped me to get in contact with her uh, because uh, she is an amazing actor. And uh, it was not so important for me that she has a Hungarian accent. But on the other hand, as you know, that what horrible things then also happened in Hungary. Uh, so... Um, I think it, it is it is quite a, a, a strange uh, uh, situation when when she is uh, talking with this Hungarian accent because she's also, for example, quoting quite often uh, the journalist, the British journalist Gidi, uh, uh, um, and uh, she she. But I think it's good that she does not have a British accent, so she has her own accent. Um, but as uh, Marina already described it, it, it brings it also to uh, on, an, on another level when there is not only, uh, when the actors are not uh, talking uh, in with Viennese dialect, for example. Um, there's another question um, about how widespread uh, this knowledge is today. It is, uh, I think people, I, well, I don't know actually what is what nowadays is. I think in schools still, I think it's it's a topic in school, I think, but it depends very much. The images should be in textbooks. Uh, you also, I talked about the Hrdlicka monument. So there is a kind of knowledge about that, uh, that this actually has happened. What I'm sure nearly no one knows is that this incident happened, and this is very clear in the film, before the German troops entered Austria. So it was uh, a few hours before the German troops entered, uh, crossed the border, the program started. So this means, of course, that not the German Nazis did that and organized it, no, the Austrian Nazis uh, and their supporter uh, organized it. And um, actually, there are uh, some um, um, reports that uh, it was too much for the Germans. They didn't want that this, uh, this, this uh, happened because they wanted not bad publicity and bad press. For example, Gidi reported uh, to the New York Times and uh, to other papers what has happened here and, and how cruel uh, the population reacts to National Socialism and what this ideology is about and so on. You, you remember uh, in history in 1936, uh, there was the Olympia where Germany presented itself as a great nation and they, uh, Leni Riefenstahl won several prizes internationally and was invited as a great filmmaker. So the Nazis managed quite for some time to, uh, to be accepted. Uh, and we know all this appeasement politics. 
and and they still wanted to give an image that in Austria uh, they they everyone wanted that 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 they that that the Anschluss happens in Austria, but they didn't want to show that this this uh, atrocities that these atrocities happen. So this was uh, also it's one quote in the video, uh, I think by Dagmar Ostermann, where she says. This was a speciality, or this was special uh, in Vienna, and it was also a starting point, so to say, I said it already before, um, for, uh, for the cruel cruelties, cruelties that followed. Um, yes. And I think this is not this not not many people because I forgot what I wanted to say because the the the, the my thought is uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, uh, regarding the question that uh, for a long time and I think still many people think that actually this happened later when the Germans already took over the power the, because of course a lot of Germans then came in in the important positions. Uh, 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 and um, and that this was actually this is also some of these victim <laughs> narratives that that the Germans actually organized it, and maybe also Austrians participated in it. I mean, you cannot deny that you see it clearly on the photo, but uh, but that it was actually the Austrian Nazis who did it. Uh, and yeah, this is this is I think not well known. And also uh, that it happened on so many places. There are not all places mentioned. There are some uh, images that would be would have been also impressive to integrate in the video, but unfortunately we couldn't afford the uh, copyright uh, for it. Um, but uh, yeah, so this I think is not so well known. And all these details that are in the film are not well known, I would say. There is um, there is a, um, a something more more of a comment. Um, I will read it. I really like the way you confronted the visitor with the question whether to erase the written words and by that this violent history, or to write down the response, which is actually also an impossible gesture. Yeah, thank you very much. This is uh, yeah exactly what I was trying to do. An impossible gesture. Yeah. Yeah, we have we have this problem with commemoration, commemoration, which is very important, but it can be a, a pathos easily. So um, and and then it can be problematic also when you commemorate to actually I, I say it now very bluntly, but to commemorate co commemorate um, to get rid of it in a way. I mean, of course, this I don't mean the the relatives of the victims or so. But I mean, uh, I mean, just uh, this public form of commemoration, sometimes or the official forms of commemoration can be also problematic in that way. So. Martin, if this is okay for you, um, I, will, um, I will take us uh, to some last words. Um, thank you um, for the evening. Thank you for this um, uh, long, but somehow still not long enough talk. I could uh, keep listening and engaging um, uh, for a much longer time. This is a, a, a really, really, um, well, deep, historically important, but incredibly topical work that you have produced that is certainly um, provoking a lot of thought about how wonderful Austria can be really called as a country. And um, I would like to thank also the Welt Museum Wien for, for hosting this event tonight, for hosting the exhibition. You might have already noticed that behind me, you can see a little glimpse into the museum actually showing excerpts of the exhibition that is still um, going on. And actually it's also possible to visit it right now until the 3rd of April, um, the entire exhibition can, um, can be visited. We are unfortunately not allowed to have guided tours on site. So we moved uh, events to the virtual space and I am going to um, give you one announcement before I really conclude um, about another artist talk we have with, um, uh, with an artist uh, in two weeks. Um, the 
this is another view of the of the exhibition and um, we have in two weeks uh, in a similar format also tuesday evening an artist talk with elizabeth bakambamba tambue uh, also a, a viennese artist um, who will talk about her work that she's showing in the exhibition it's called the eye and um, we would uh, of course appreciate um, if you are participating again and um, i conclude for those who are uh, more interested into the background uh, of the exhibition with two links. Um, the entire exhibition is a result of a research project that uh, is led by Professor Marina Fasinic at the Academy of uh, Fine Arts in Vienna and uh, the Archive of Amnesia is our website. And um, because it is uh, not so easy to visit the museum these days physically for everyone uh, under um, the Weltmuseum Wien website, there is a big online collection of artist talks of all of the artists. Um, there is also another uh, conversation with Martin Krenn that covers again, different aspects than what we have covered, uh, what uh, they have covered tonight and, um, and, uh, and uh, talks and presentations by other artists involved. Um, I think with this, maybe I give the word uh, to Marina Grzynic to, to really con conclude. And I say thank you from my side for tonight. Uh, yes, I just uh, uh, say thank you very much, uh, Martin, uh, for this uh, uh, really very important work because, uh, and uh, I hope uh, that will be really part of many other presentations that is necessary. Also for the talk, um, for us, for our project, I must uh, repeat, uh, uh, such research projects was key. This is why also to do the show, the show was precisely to go back to unearth these topics, uh, anti-Semitism definitely in the Austrian context, uh, 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 colonialism in the Belgian context, uh, turbo nationalism in ex Yugoslavia context. Uh, but uh, uh, as I said, uh, um, uh, this uh, um, slogan uh, uh, that uh, it's still uh, uh, available for us in the next uh, until 2024 it's also to be put into particles and the history uh, has to be brought directly onto our eyes and this is what you did so practically with this visuality you just give us like di directly you, you don't want to see then you will see. And I think we have to see these things and the way how you did it is. Uh, you gave me back the idea of the power of small formats with a very small amount of money, but with a very precise concept that actually has a place and are very, very important. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was great to talking with you. Thanks a million. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye-bye.